Hello everyone. Welcome to a journal club for vestibular first. We're very happy to discuss dysautonomia and concussion because it is such an important topic and we are extremely joyful to have two brilliant guests with us this evening. Our two guests are going to introduce themselves, so I will let Lauren begin. Hi, thank you so much for having me. We're so excited to be here. Uh, my name is Lauren Zayax, and I'm a PT ATC out of Park City, Utah, and I have the privilege of working for Intermountain Healthcare there. Uh, my research is predominantly in concussion, and then because of my work in concussion, we've moved into the autonomic space. Um, and then because of COVID, that has really exploded in the last three years. And so now we're getting to learn so much more about this diagnosis that was really misunderstood and, and not well um, accepted in the medical field for a long time. So that's, that's me. Well, we appreciate your important work. And our other special guest, Jenna, go ahead. Hi, I'm Dr. Jenna, Jenna Tucker. Thank you for having us. Um, I am a full-time faculty member in the School of Physical Therapy at Kane University. Um, I also am still a treating clinician part-time um, at Kessler Institute for Rehab in West Orange. And I also do some clinical work um, on Kane's campus as well with our students. My research, um, similar to Lauren's, started in brain injury and concussion and has now evolved to dysautonomia. Um, and we are um, have developed this strong partnership between us and Intermountain to really um, hopefully, you know, get some more information out there for a diagnosis that's really, I think, not so well understood um, in a lot of population um, and, you know, across the country. And I think it hopefully we'll continue to get more information out there and build on the research that is available um, to help clinicians treat it a little more efficiently and effectively and help our patients. Perfect. All right. So to, to get us into this topic, we're going to discuss a particular article. Um, it has quite a lengthy title, but I'll read it out. It is the measurement of improvement on repeat exercise intolerance testing for suspected dysautonomia in protracted concussion recovery, a retrospective cohort study. So <laughs> that is a mouthful, but uh, we're going to get into it. So I always like to start every one of our journal clubs with a, just a brief touch on the vestibular system. Since we are vestibular first and everyone who is watching this may not have ever encountered the vestibular system before, they are watching this. So uh, the inner ear balance system, that is our vestibular apparatus, lives deep inside the inner ear, neighbors with the hearing structures, and um, helps us maintain our balance and orient us in space. The information that goes from that little sensor, we have one on the left and one on the right, you know, the, each side of our inner ears, um, goes to the brain. So we have nice connecting nerves, or kind of telephone wires, I like to call them, sending information up to the brain. <laughs> and the brain loves it when everybody's on the same page, the inner ears, information from our eyes, information from our joints. And I would say information that comes um, kind of to and fro from our heart and other kind of autonomic system, which we're going to get into, um, it would be nice if that was also working uh, properly. And so <laughs> all systems are go, everything is great, uh, homeostasis is there, and the body and brain are happy. Unfortunately, uh, for various reasons, things can go awry with some of these systems, and uh, we're going to talk about concussion specifically. So concussion, in a broad sense, is an injury to the brain that results in a disruption to brain function. Um, it can be due to direct trauma or acceleration, deceleration, so the head doesn't actually have to hit anything, um, and such as a whiplash injury or a blast injury. Um, it does not require a loss of consciousness, and because the brain is um, the center, the king, the computer system, however you want to kind of describe it, um, all information from all of our systems that I mentioned, vision, vestibular, and cardiovascular, et cetera, all kind of intertwine up there. Um, a concussion can result in quite a variety of symptoms depending on uh, what pathways may have been disrupted or kind of secondary issues after the injury. It's complicated. <laughs> so. Um, the article starts out discussing how research has identified concussion-related exercise intolerance as one of, potent of the potential persistent symptoms uh, post-concussion. 
defined as the inability to exercise at or near an age-appropriate maximum heart rate due to exacerbation of concussion-related symptoms. So I am going to let, <laughs> I'll say Lauren, I'm just going to pick you all randomly, up, by the way. This is how I roll. Um, to explain a little more, I have my kind of written explanation here about the autonomic nervous system, why or how it might they theoretically, maybe, maybe theories might be proven, maybe a mix, <laughs> how it might get dysregulated um, after concussion and the sympathetic and parasympathetic components of that. Go. Okay. Well, I'm going to turf to Jenna the nervous system itself, because I know she's going to make me answer most of the clinical questions. Um, but as far as, far as theories about the why, you know, it, it most likely has to do with the relay centers in our brain and our brainstem being susceptible through that whiplash injury. And then also those grand central station areas in our brain, those four key relay centers that control mm -hmm. our autonomic nervous system. And so as they understand more and more about this shearing force of the white and gray matter and the axons that go between them becoming disrupted, and as we understand more about the functional regulation and integration of those sensory systems, we're learning more about the potential cause. So it's only very recently that the American Academy of Neurology even stated that autonomic dysfunction can happen from a head injury. Um, so we still have so far to go to prove the theories, but, but mostly it is theories um, for right now. Uh, Jenna, do you want to take the uh, sympathetic, parasympathetic? I'll answer it, but you're better at it than me. So, yeah, so um, some of you may or may not know, but um, within our nervous system, we have two big divisions. So we have our sympathetic division, which often is referred to as our fight or flight. We have our parasympathetic division. People usually know it as rest and digest. And the main kind of goal of the body to maintain homeostasis is to maintain a constant balance between those two. And um, so that way there's um, uptick of one versus the other, and it alternates throughout different activities. And um, they're always kind of in this cycle of balance, if you will. Um, and post-concussion, there's a whole kind of slew of onset of pathophysiologic patho changes. And these alterations kind of in cerebral blood flow and in um, chemical balances and metabolic changes that happen within the brain, they kind of just disrupt everything. And there becomes this imbalance um, of, the, of the autonomic nervous system. So we tend to see a lot of sympathetic overdrive where individuals kind of get stuck in this very high sympathetic state. So you're going to see things like elevated heart rate as a common symptom. Um, but in other cases, it's just that they cannot regulate back and forth well between the two systems. Um, so like I said, more commonly a little sympathetic drive or higher sympathetic drive, but also can just be that inability to easily kind of toggle between those two systems um, to maintain a level of kind of, home, of homeostasis. Um, so with that, what we can see is, as you can imagine, if you're in a high sympathetic state at all times, exercise is going to require even more sympathetic drive, right? So if you're adding exercise, um, that tolerance really is limited because you're already kind of in too much of that sympathetic state. Um, and so that's how we wind up with these symptoms. Is that kind of covering what you were hoping that for? That's perfect. You guys are a rock star team, <laughs> as I figured. So uh, that's what I want. I all just, right. I have one other piece, yeah, um, and I don't please. know if we're going to get to it later. That's okay. Um, but what What's also really important about your autonomic nervous system is it predominantly stabilizes the blood flow to your brain or your brain blood pressure. And so you have a receptor in your neck, your, your baroreceptor in your carotid artery, and that's constantly checking how much blood flow is going to your brain. And one of the areas of research for concussion is this alteration in, as Jono was mentioning, like the cerebral blood flow, but also brain blood pressure. And so we should be doing whatever we can with our blood pressure and our heart rate to maintain homeostasis in that perfusion to our brain. And so what ends up happening is this fundamental disruption between the sinus node in your heart and the perception of how much blood is going to your brain. And so as we talk about the exercise, you'll see these swings in their heart rate or you'll see inappropriate tachycardic or high heart rate responses because the brain is overreacting to this change or because we're not stabilizing the blood flow and the, the brain is having to send extra impulses. So if we're not shunting that blood flow back up to our core and to our brain, 
our brain perceives a lack of oxygen or lack of nutrients, and so it sends that increased heart rate, or it should send an increased heart rate response. And in some patients, it doesn't, and they just have the brain fog, the headache, the dizziness, because they're perceiving that alteration of blood flow to their brain. So for the, for the more functional side of it, it's really that we're trying to stabilize the whole system and bring back that homeostasis so we get all those good nutrients so we can heal our brain. Got it. All right. Well, that is a lot of information, and I love every bit of it. So um, you, you kind of alluded to this, I feel, Jenna, so I'm going to let you go on this slide. Um, kind of two major nerves, and I know that the, the, the autonomic nervous system is not just made up of two major nerves, um, but for simplicity's sake, I feel like a lot of folks have at least heard of the vagus nerve, can we stimulate it, what is it for? Um, do you mind just maybe breaking that down? I, I kind of pulled a little information uh, you know, out on the slide here, but maybe you could give us a little bit more. Yeah, so it's funny, we actually covered this in clinical neuroscience today, we did cranial nerves. So, um, so yeah, so our vagus nerve is a cranial nerve, right? and its main function really is to drive the parasympathetic nervous system, right? It's looking to help us maintain that, um, that rest and digest as best we can. In general, we tend to be not only in a post-concussive state, but as a society, I feel like we've become kind of sympathetic overdrivers. Um, so you'll see there's a lot of stuff going out there right now about how to stimulate the vagus nerve and how to engage your parasympathetic nervous system more. Um, and really it's, um, it's to help kind of, um, bring everything down, if you will, right? Let us kind of calm down. And as Lauren talked about, that is such a crucial component of concussion recovery, because if you're not in that rest and digest phase and you're in this high, high sympathetic state, um, you can't get that good blood flow to, and nutrients to the brain. You can't promote healing to the tissue that's been impacted. Um, so this is where the vagus nerve becomes really important. Um, does that? Yeah, perfect. No, mm -hmm. that's exactly what I wanted. And I think, um, you know, we don't want to make the sympathetic nerve or system to be out the, the bad guy, right? Because people might already be saying to themselves, well, well, if the exercise drives up, you know, the sympathetic system, and you're saying, maybe I should just lay in a dark room for days and rest, right? So this is the temptation, oh, no. right? We both know that, well, all three of us, we all three know this is <laughs> not the plan. Um, so this is where it can get confusing, I would say, um, for, I would perhaps even say clinicians and patients, right, to say, okay, well, what's kind of the best path forward? And we're going to get to kind of treatment as we talk about exercise specifically and other possible, you know, ancillary treatment considerations uh, for a group that, that is maybe dealing with some of these autonomic issues post-concussion. So um, let's talk um, about... <laughs> I just yeah. want to tap into your... Please. Some of your audience will be vestibular uh, yeah. therapists. And so they're used to this challenge of like, can we elicit the sympathetic and reduce and, and increase the parasympathetic, especially those who treat 3PD, persistent postural perceptual dizziness, right? And we know that the vestibular system has a strong connection with our sympathetic drive, which is why being dizzy is such an anxiety producing experience and a traumatic experience. Um, we're not biologically or genetically set up to move in cars at 80 miles an hour and to go on roller coasters. We're still kind of like thousands of years ago. Um, and so we're used to this idea of like our sympathetic nervous system is not bad, just like you said. It's all about that tease and that push pull and trigger a little bit and then recover and start to habituate the brain that a little sensation is not a bad thing, right? It keeps us alive and it keeps us integrated with our environment. Perfect. Yes. No, excellent point. And thank you for bringing that up. Um, but in the spirit of the article and, and figuring out how do we use exercise in an effective way for this group, um, <laughs> where we're, you know, and this is a struggle with three PD patients, I would argue, as well sometimes to say, okay, <laughs> You know, how do we have that? I call it the Goldilocks. How do we do the Goldilocks level uh, of, you know, stimulation and then settling um, down a little bit? Uh, the Buffalo concussion treadmill test is discussed quite a bit in this article, so I felt like we need to hit that up next. Is considered a gold standard for assessing exercise intolerance, uh, specifically post-concussion, uh, with the hope of using the information gathered on that test to guide appropriate exercise prescription to facilitate uh, autonomic nervous system recovery and ideally resolution of symptoms. Um, so 
I, you know, pulled a, a bit of a summary. This is, you know, it's explained well in the article. It's free online. You can definitely find, you know, the exact protocol, how it's supposed to be performed. It can be modified for a bicycle or an arm ergometer. So we have lots of options. Um, but in the spirit of the Buffalo concussion treadmill test, is there anything specifically you want to add about that? Either of you, I'm just going to open the door here. Go ahead. I can see you bursting <laughs> ready to just go. I think it's important for, because we took an established test, right? And we repurposed it for a different population. And so it's important to understand that you can modify this test in different ways as long as you're tracking the same variables. So I might have a patient whose upright tolerance is not great, it's, it's fairly poor, but they walked into the clinic. And so it's safe, if it's safe within 72 hours post brain injury to do an exertional test, it'll be safe for these patients as well. But perhaps I have to take that 3.2 miles per hour standard speed and reduce it to 2.8 mm -hmm. miles per hour. That's okay. The point of the test is to exercise to failure, but that means a three-point increase in symptoms. That's what's considered a failure of the test, or if they meet 85% of their age-expected max, right? So the goal is not to get to 20 minutes on the test. If their symptoms go up by three points at minute four, that's okay. That's the max that they can accomplish that day. So it's, it's, we took from very well-established research to try to have an objective measure that can look at this autonomic function and look at these different symptoms that were, that were slightly different than what was presented in the original literature from this youth male sports population of traditionally headaches and dizziness, concussion type symptoms. But perhaps it's this general malaise when they're done exercising or mm -hmm. abnormal heart rate responses, or perhaps it's an emotional response. You know, in the beginning, we had people bursting into tears on the treadmill. And I was like, listen, I've been treating concussions a long time. I don't know what that is at first. Right. Um, and so it's, it's, taking this gold standard test and just tweaking it a little bit so it can be more accessible to people who aren't one week post concussion, but maybe they're more severely impaired. Maybe they've been deconditioned for a year. And so you might be concerned about the safety of the test. Just reduce the speed and then keep your variables consistent as you retest over time. A hundred percent. I think something that's really important, and I see this a lot as a, as a faculty member and a professor, a lot of people are looking for black and white and they want to just follow protocols to protocol. And I get that, right? That's, that's where a lot of people are comfortable and there's, you know, research to support, et cetera. And everyone in the concussion community will tell you they are, we are very grateful to Dr. Letty and the work he has done. He has really kind of laid a lot of groundwork. Um, and I think what Lauren was talking about is really important though, that the test was designed and mostly has been researched in that youth male athlete population, which is a great place to start. But if you look at current statistics, the vast majority of those who sustain a concussion are not young male athletes, believe it or not. Everyone thinks that is, but it's not the case. It's just where a lot of the research lies. And the press. So, and the press, exactly. Um, so, and it's a great sample to, to study, right? I mean, it's yeah. a very controlled, you have good access to those people. So it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And it is. And it was a great place to start. And so, but I think what we were, a lot of our goal was to start to let's expand out to the bigger, a broader population. Um, if you look at our demographics in our study, it's predominantly female. The average age is in the mid twenties. It's a little higher than that. And they're not athletes. So I think it's important that we're starting to expand to see that in, you know, in the case of these individuals and some other studies that are, we currently have going on, that it is still safe to apply it to these individuals as well. And to, we really need to, I think, ramp up that research um, and get people more comfortable, maybe making some adjustments and modifications, as Lauren said, um, but testing them to be able to see if, they, you know, they can make these same, similar type improvements. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, for myself, I get the occasional athlete, but my practice in general is, you know, my community, right? So I have a lot of middle-aged to, you know, older adults. Um, and I have been the first one to suggest concussion <laughs> for more than one of them because they're coming in, they had a fall, they didn't hit their head, but someone's like, oh, you yeah, probably have BPPV, which sometimes they do. But then we clear that and I'm like, yeah, it still seems like you have signs of concussion, you know, um, it's not anyone's fault. It's just it's not necessarily on the top of people's mind, um, you know, as it might be after a car accident or 
you know, an athletic um, type sports related activity that, you know, seemed to have really created force that people say, oh, is that a concussion? Which good that we have awareness there, but, you know, it definitely could spread a little more to other <laughs> Area. I also think you'll hear it. any of my students will tell you my biggest pet peeve is the phrase, it's just a concussion. Like I, it drives me crazy. But I think you're right. In a lot of these individuals, people are hesitant to, or they write it off as like, oh, it's just a concussion. It'll pass. Um, and so I think, you know, getting them in to do this kind of testing is really important to be like, no, we can actually improve these symptoms um, if we, we can just get that testing done. Absolutely. All right. So speaking of testing, uh, here is kind of what I believe is the traditional um, things you would need if one was to perform the, the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test. You've got a treadmill with a 15% incline because part of the test is gradually increase the incline each minute. Um, some sort of way to monitor heart rate. We can talk about that in a second because I want to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> Um, you know, I guess you could say some, something that you can exercise in because you're going to be moving and, um, you know, a setup for safety. I think what's also missing here, I always check blood pressure before and after the test. Um, you all mentioned oxygen saturation, which I tend to also check at least before and after. But let's talk about heart rate, heart rate monitoring. What are our options? Um, any recommendations? So there's a lot of um, monitors available out there. Um, the one that we predominantly use, Lauren, correct me, it's the Polar Heart Rate Monitor. Um, ideally, if they have the chest band to go with it, it is is much more effective than the peripheral monitors. Um, Lauren, you can add to that, I'm sure. So what's, what's wild about the peripheral monitors is that they're validated at rest, not with exercise, um, but... They don't really say that on the $300 packaging that they come in. Uh, and so if you have, and, and Letty's research is very clear that we should be using the devices that the patient has, right? Because you want to validate the test to what their device so is if they're wearing an Apple Watch, that's what you would use is what you're saying. In theory, because that's, the, that's what the research says. But if we start to extrapolate out to this other population with autonomic dysfunction, um, what we actually are finding in a big part of these articles was we, we changed our entire clinic policy after this research article because the peripheral monitors were showing these huge drops in heart rate. And when we added the central monitor, we were not finding the same. We were still finding drops that were strange, but they weren't 30 beats per minute anymore. And so on an optical sensor, that little green light on the back of your watch or on your O2 sat is checking every 30 to 60 seconds the blood flow through your, through your extremity. So if you have autonomic dysfunction, and predominantly in our patients we see this, we actually see a mismatch early on in their tests, and it improves over time, you're shunting blood flow away from your extremities. So those readings become inaccurate. So now I'm trying to have a really concise, objective measurement, but I'm not measuring what I think I'm measuring. And there are issues with the polar heart rate monitor, especially for women with more tissue, um, right? But it's better because it's beat to beat measurement. So it's actually your V1, V2 nodes on your five lead EKG. And so we're now asking patients, if at all possible, to obtain a central monitor, whether it's Garmin, um, it comes with their Peloton or ideally Polar. Um, we're able to really track exactly what's happening. And what's exciting about those monitors is we can actually start to pick up signs of different arrhythmias. And so we can determine who should be referred on, even though PVCs are generally benign, um, it's, you can actually see them because you'll see the misreading on the monitor. So you'll see a steep drop and then a big increase. And that's usually because there was a skipped beat or an early beat that the monitor can't pick up. Um, and so, yes, you can use your peripheral monitors, but an $80 monitor is a lot cheaper than a $300 monitor and it's significantly more accurate. And so we try to really push patients as much as humanly possible to get as accurate of measurements and get rid of me as fast as possible, which saves them money in the long run um, in, their, in their fitness journey and in their health journey. Now, what about those patients that say, well, I just want to do old school and, and you know, do my pulse on my wrist or even my carotid artery. What are your thoughts on that group? That group is probably a challenge in and of itself for a variety of reasons. And so you just dance your let's make a deal dance to the best of your ability. But I, you know, if finances are a challenge, it's a different conversation. If it's rigidity or resistance, then I try to just 
gently remind them that going to physical therapy can be an expensive endeavor. And so Mm -hmm. less visits with me because we have really accurate readings will save you in the long run. And my jail, my jokes get really stale. So you only want to see me like a set number of times. So you don't have to listen to them over and over again, you know? Oh, oh, the stale joke threat. Look at that. All right. So, okay. Well, that's really helpful because I, I mean, I have worked enough that I would say I've heard all those things uh, myself. (laughs) So, you know, it's just nice to know, you know, do I have a strong argument? Like, why is it worth me saying in your case, because I'm seeing this as being a a clear issue, right? Because I've had patients come in and they are tolerating activity great, actually, which is fantastic. Like, that's always exciting to me. I'm like, oh, phew, like I just got to, you know, maybe they have a little vestibular issue, maybe a little ocular motor, maybe a little neck. Okay. Like, you know, so, uh, you know, a concussion, uh, uh, what is, I think even the article, maybe it said, like, if you've seen a concussion, you've seen one concussion kind of thing, right? So you get your mix and not everyone has this activity intolerance. But um, for those who that seems to be a part of their puzzle or a layer to their onion, I like to say, Um, then I can maybe make that uh, a a stronger argument. So that's really helpful. All right. Now, the article is pretty clear about a rating system for exertion. Um, So, Lauren, do you want to speak to that as well? Yes, so we we use the one Letty recommends, so the 6 to 20 scale, uh, because that one's better support in the research. If a patient is using RPE for exercise progression, we tend to go to the 1 to 10 just because mm. it's it's easier. It's more manageable right. for the patient. Um, but for the actual test, we try to stay, I like, you know, I like to dance a little bit. Maybe I change the speed um, and I track that change. But otherwise, we try to stay as close to the research as we can. And so they're very clear that they, they want you using um, this scale. And so that's what we use. Got it. Perfect. Yeah, there's some patients who I will say are not going to grasp this. Um, scale. So I would say, again, use your clinical judgment. You think this isn't going to work out and you're not going to get information, good information at all from it because they're just like kind of not, you know, they're struggling with that. Even if you put it up there, they just, it's not working for them. You just might have to go back to that one to 10 might click a little easier. So use your good judgment there, but ideally for the Buffalo, we're trying to use the six to 20. All right. And just stay consistent. If you have to modify, then you just always modify the same. That's okay. It's, it's okay to modify for that. I'd rather not take each minute to have a conversation theoretically about which number they're at, right? Like, right. I just, I'll switch so it's easier. <laughs> Fair enough. I think it's also like pick and choose your battles, right? So if they are, if they're, one of their concussion symptoms is they're having difficulty with attention and their cognitive processing is a challenge for them. Let's not make it more complicated than it needs to be, right? And that, again, I think it's pick and choose your battles. For sure, for sure. Case by case, I like it. All <laughs> right, so back to the article. I like to just pull things right from it on my slides here. So current recommendations for the treatment of concussion-associated exercise intolerance involves a prescription of cardiovascular exercise beginning at 80% of that heart rate threshold. And the heart rate threshold is when the heart rate... Um, what the heart rate was, I want to say, at the time that the patient rated their symptoms as more than two units, if you will, greater than baseline. So just to remind everyone, symptoms we are rating on a zero to 10. (laughs) Um, So you might have to have two pieces of paper up, and this is for symptoms, and this is for how hard you're working, and that's okay. so symptoms, you know, 0 to 10, and they, that is really specific in my experience to the patient. So for some of them, their primary complaint is headache. For some of them, it's nausea. For some of them, it's dizziness. Some of them, it's fogginess. If they have like 10 different kinds of symptoms, you may not want to go with all 10, right? You want to maybe go with one or two or the more dominant or the ones that they kind of already know maybe seem to be the ones that elevate with activity. Uh, am I on there? So you guys are kind of nodding, so I'm hoping mm-hmm. that's right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, that's reassuring. All right. So, <laughs> yes. So that's when you're doing the buffalo. You're going to stop the test, um, assuming they get a symptom elevation. If they don't, great. But <laughs> assuming they do, you stop that test, like you said, four minutes or whatever it was until it crossed that threshold. So you're trying to really get from them. And I love someone like, oh, I think it's like 
1.2. Like they like to like give me like like a little in between. And that's fine. I let them say whatever they want as long as we get to the point where it crosses that official okayness. If we started at a one, now it's a four. Okay, that's three units up. We're you know that's our our stop point. So kind of understanding that is important. <laughs> um, so you kind of know what that threshold is and that heart rate right at that moment um, is supposed to be the threshold. Mm -hmm. So you all had some patients, you wanted them to have had the test. Um, after their injury, um, they had what sounded like possible dysautonomia and they got another Buffalo concussion treadmill test um, after some intervention, some therapy, right? Physical therapy, specifically mm -hmm. exercise, monitored exercise, right? Yeah. Um, so you end up with 12 patients. Um, like you mentioned, they were kind of roundabouts 20-ish, give or take, um, a few years there. And um, the average days from injury to their first test, the Buffalo concussion test, pre-test, if you will, pre-intervention, was about 30 days out. And the average uh, days between, wait, no, an average of 37, yeah, so kind of like the, their treatment time. Your treatment was duration, a, essentially. Right, it was about, will. yeah, 37 days. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll call it a month-ish. And um, I had a thought on this already, which is, all of us have had patients who are being seen months or years after their initial concussion. Is this stuff out the window for that group? How do we, how do we modify it maybe? What are your thoughts? I need that now because I've got a few toughies. Go ahead. You're, it's, it's never too late. Neuroplasticity means as long as we try to implement change, your brain will change and will be adaptable. You know, the, the more chronic you are, the more likely you are to have other functional neurological disorders like pain centralization or chronic pain, chronic dizziness, functional movement disorders, things like that. So you're going to have to address those other pieces as well, especially if this is a patient that's been conditioned that exercise increases my symptoms, mm -hmm. right? So there's a fair amount of building their confidence. Um, but the majority of my concussion caseload is more than three months out. Um, and so we're able to start this. Now, in, in the current literature for dysautonomia, to, to qualify for dysautonomia, you have to have symptoms for more than three months. But we know that there's autonomic disruption uh, immediately after head injury. So I don't know who's going to duke it out to decide where that actual threshold is. Um, but regardless, you can start this treatment as early as 72 hours post-injury based on the current literature. Early exercise is better with a goal of not becoming a chronic patient. Um, but then if a patient is five years out, you know, my chronic illness that was a mystery for 10, 12 years was actually POTS. Um, and it was in treating this population that I found out why I was sick for so long. So it's taken me longer to go through the protocol um, that we've released, but able to go through it and able to exercise for the first time in over a decade, which is nothing but good for, for your health and your nervous system long term. So there's always hope. You just have to be more gentle mm -hmm. the more chronic they are. Just like you have to be the more chronic their low back pain is, right? Because there's going to be all these other pieces to their human psyche and their human condition. And then unfortunately, the effects of physical deconditioning is going to play a big role for those people as well. Yeah. And that was kind of, a, a, if you read, I don't know if we're going to get there when we talk about more of the discussion and conclusion from the study, but... So a lot of the research, like we said, is in this youth athlete population, right? They're primed to bounce back, if you will, much quicker than many of the individuals that people are treating. And so when you look at a lot of the research, they do their, you know, pre-intervention BCTT, their Buffalo concussion test. They get their heart rate threshold. They exercise with that heart rate threshold and they get better with in a fairly short time frame. So what we were really looking at is, so those people who we run that pre-intervention BCTT, we get their heart rate threshold, which is higher than, or a little off from what the traditional one we're seeing in the literature. Um, it, they will, they'll follow that protocol, but it takes them much longer to get better. And so the trick is, if you keep that same heart rate threshold from the original test you did, and you just stretch that out, 
Is that as effective as what we did here, which was if you reassess the BCTT, reset to their new heart rate threshold, mm -hmm. and now exercise at that new heart rate threshold, can you more effectively over time and um, efficiently reduce that duration of treatment, even if it's still longer? Does that make sense? A hundred percent. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it does then, kind of resonate with PTs, I think. Most of us are kind of not every session, but frequent recheckers like, oh, let's see how we're doing on this one. Let's see how we're doing on that one. But of course, you can't do it too much because, uh, you know, it's a fine line. Again, go relax everything. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Lauren, you wanted to add something. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. And this was a subset of the original study. So in the original study, we introduced the idea of the treadmill test identifying autonomic dysfunction. So using that test for a different purpose. And then these were the people who didn't matriculate out the way the research said they should have. So in the original, in Letty's research and Letty's group's research, um, they talk a lot about you set that original parameter and then you increase sequentially by five to 10 beats per minute, typically per week in that population until they achieve 80% of their age expected max. But there's no guideline for how often to retest or who you should retest. So we happen to have this subset of patients who had multiple tests because as a clinician at the time, not knowing we were going to do research on it, we were just like, okay, they're not matriculating through the way that they're supposed to. Let's do a retest and see what's mm -hmm. happening. And so we ended up with this cohort that had multiple tests. And, and that's where this data came from, was from those people who just naturally were not progressing the same way. And so what was exciting was that we were able to see physiological change, even though the patients weren't 100% better at the time of the repeat test. The other people who were in the original study didn't get retested because they returned to their activity um, as expected. Got it. Perfect. All right. So um, this is a recap. When we stop the test, it's not necessarily just, um, you know, because of this elevation of three points or more from their resting symptom score. Also, it might be because of their rating of perceived excursion on our 6 to 20 Borg scale, uh, greater than 17 without significant symptom exacerbation. Would you call that one a good thing? That they're not feeling more symptoms with that level of exertion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. So you're like, I mean, oh. and it's interesting. It depends on which year of their <laughs> Buffalo's research uh, you look at, because sometimes it's 19 RPE, sometimes it's 17 RPE. Okay. What, what is interesting is what is the heart rate number at that RPE? So mm. I have a patient who's a 17 RPE, but their heart rate is 65% of their age expected max. That's odd. Um, or, and more often what we see in our, autonomic pa in our patients with autonomic disorders is I have, my heart rate is at 85% of my age expected max and my RPE is an 11. So I'm tachycardic for my perceived level of effort. We wouldn't call that effective deconditioning, right? Because if it was deconditioning, your tolerance to exercise should be low. Your RPE should be artificially high. And mm -hmm. so you'll see also this mismatch. So it's really interesting when you stop a test based on the literature to see where the heart rate falls in correlation with it and how appropriate the two numbers actually match up with one another. Does that make sense? Always ask yourself, my friends. All right. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, clinical judgment, of course, that'd be like a safety issue or, you know, something going on. Uh, patient reaching 90% or more of their age expected max uh, without any increase in symptoms and still reporting that low sense of exertion, right? So that's kind of what you just mentioned, I would say, or the patient says they need to stop. Um, so you had a nice kind of... Um, Algorithm guideline, I was going to call these lots of fun arrows, uh, which does not all fit on one slide, so I kind of chopped it up a little bit uh, <laughs> to what I wanted to talk about. Um, <laughs> so you have these patients, um, and you do the Buffalo concussion treadmill test when they come in because they're post-concussion, which brings me to a side question. Would you say that every patient who's had a concussion should get a Buffalo concussion treadmill test or some sort of exertional test or not necessarily so? And why? I guess the question would be, why are you doing the test? Yeah. So just to do it, just to do it, I don't know. You've probably got other things you could do with 20 minutes of your clinic time that costs the patient money. Um, if you have questions and you want to know where to start the patient, then I would say absolutely. But um, 
it all it also depends on where you work and, and things like that. But that would be my clinical opinion about it. Keep in mind, I, I mean, I, I think Lauren would agree with me that the vast majority of individuals, though, should be engaging in some graded exercise yes. protocol. So if you have any concerns, questions, et cetera, about where to start them, it can't hurt in that sense to run the test. Right. Um, like Lauren said, there could be things that you could be doing better things with 20 minutes, but at the same time, it is only 20 minutes. It's not, you know, so maybe it is beneficial if you're not 100% sure where to start them or if you have any concerns. Right. Um, because they should be engaging in some graded exercise progression right. from that, after that 72 hours. And if they're showing our, a lot of insensitivity to motion, like I know the treadmill can be really tough for a group that have like a higher vestibular presentation in my experience, which is definitely something I feel confident on. So that group, once I'm sure they don't have BPPV or I've cleared that, which is always something you should check, always, 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 please post-concussion, just at least check it once, and then if they mention anything that's like a change, maybe check it again. Anyway, because uh, that's an easy fix, people. We can do this. <laughs> well, once that's good, um, then I, I would maybe start them on a bike. If you're like worried they're not going to tolerate the treadmill, you can still, like I said earlier, do this on a bike. Um, so you can looking at that really that exertion piece, but maybe taking out some of that you know, kind of more difficult motion uh, intolerance piece. So there's a lot of ways to, to look at that, right? Yeah, it's all about getting the heart rate up, which is going to promote the blood flow to the brain and promote that healing. And Letty did a great article um, that showed that the stationary bike was just as effective. Um, and it's, it's the modality really is your choice. It's really about getting the heart rate up and that cardiovascular system moving. And I'll add that if we're talking about an earlier injury, like less than three months, well, actually, in almost all cases, we don't do a Buffalo treadmill test on our first visit uh, because we have to take time to do education and BPPV testing and clearing the C-spine and da-da-da-da. Yeah. Um, but all patients are educated on symptom-guided, no more than three-point increase during or after, exercise, typically starting around a three out of 10 RPE, so 30% effort and then sequentially increasing from there. So over that first week, they're charged with, I want you exercising to tolerance, whether it's a stationary bike or going for a walk. The patients that come back and tell us that they've had trouble, that they can't um, assess themselves or they can't troubleshoot themselves, those people are definitely getting a Buffalo treadmill test because now I can really fight. I have a little power to fight with that patient too and say, hey, the reason you haven't been feeling good riding your mountain bike, even though I told you not to, is because your heart rate threshold is 105 beats per minute. So like now you get an objective prescription and that test gives me power and that not only for me to clinically understand where to start them, but it really gives me power to negotiate with that patient on why they have to do the things that I'm asking them to do. Um, and then for our more chronic people, Yes, it still probably happens on the second visit, unless I think autonomic dysfunction is their primary driver, then I'll prioritize that above everything else. Uh, probably, hopefully not BPPV if they're six months or a year out post-injury. Um, and so I might have a little more time to do this test if necessary, and, and that appears to be the, the domain um, that's their primary driver, then we would prioritize that earlier in their care. Perfect. All right. So... If they get normal results on their Buffalo concussion treadmill test, then we can, you know, like you said, educate them to exercise and, you know, move forward from there if they have other areas that need work. If they do not have a normal response, um, then you can start with this kind of protocol from Letty, although you guys had some kind of other ideas, so we're going to get to those. Um, if that's going well, right, so you're progressing them, um, you can follow the traditional Letty path, I believe, is this kind of five to 10 beats per minute increase every other week until we return to the prior level of function. Um, but if not, then this is where the retest comes in. Is that kind of the summary of that flow? Pretty good there? All right, not bad, excellent. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, some people do better, I would say, also with these kind of pictures. So, you know, it's just a little reminder here to don't have to just focus on numbers, which could be, you know, maybe difficult or overwhelming for certain patients at a certain point. They're just like, so many numbers, and I don't even know anymore. Everything's an 11 or something like that. So, you know, you just kind of have to <laughs> go a different route um, so that, you know, you're giving them an opportunity to really try to 
you know, and I'll just, I use the word baseline a lot. So compared to how you came in before we'd done any activity, and I know sometimes they've ridden in the car and that bothered them or something, but you try your best <laughs> to have like a baseline when they come in that you can try to use as a way to compare when kind of they might be feeling overwhelmed by symptoms. Um, and I think we've all had patients that we're presenting that way. So, you know, we just have to be aware of that and try to find a good way to successfully try to gauge, you know, what's impacting them and, you know, what's really um, making changes to how they're feeling. Um, of course, as we've kind of alluded a few times now, a patient coming in with concussion often will not have an uh, autonomic issue as their only issue if they have that. <laughs> um, so here's a nice little bubble reminder of... <laughs> Some of the things, and it's not even necessarily all-inclusive, but some of the things we should be thinking about for the patient, uh, mood, ocular motor issues, neck issues, um, cognition, which I often find kind of comes from some of these other issues, but, you know, <laughs> it's, if, it, if we've treated everything and everything feels great and the cognition is kind of what's left, <laughs> then we kind of know that maybe that needs more addressing. And I'm not against getting cognitive therapy, but I have had patients who also kind of burn out um, because if they're trying to get PT and OT and speech, for example, that can be a lot. Um, so sometimes we have to prioritize, and I am a little biased also that I think physical activity that's not happening should be getting that rolling first. <laughs> um, you know, uh, but that's my, my opinion perhaps. And uh, of course, headache issues can be huge because if the person particularly had a pre-concussion uh, pre migraine history, uh, we know that sometimes that makes it more challenging <laughs> to um, kind of manage the headache piece, which can be a huge barrier uh, to being able to, you know, kind of return to activity and, and try different therapies. So oh, it can be a lot. This is why I think many clinicians that I have spoken with can feel quite overwhelmed. <laughs> uh, I think what's so important there, though, is that's why it's great to build a good team around you. Uh -huh. um, even if it's you know, we talk so much in the concussion community about interdisciplinary approaches and um, interprofessional teams, which are great. And I think, like you said, PT, OT speech is fantastic. Um, but I think even within the PT realm, like there are some of us who really enjoy and specialize in treating the autonomic component and those, not myself, who really treat the cervical component. <laughs> um, but, so, you know, not being afraid to work with teammates and colleagues who maybe specialize in different aspects of it to make sure that you're not burning the patient out and just kind of running them in circles and I think is really important when it comes to this stage because it is very overwhelming to have such a variety of symptoms that can really be powerful and impact your day-to-day -day activities. For sure. And remembering that they're integrated systems, right? So we want to treat our eyes and our inner ears together the way that they functionally work. And so instead of having a 60-minute appointment for this and a 60-minute appointment for for this, can we share domains? Can our OT be interested in vestibular rehab and do some of that piece? Or can we separate them out as neuro and ortho? Like how can we how can we make this work together so that the patient who's not a full-time patient, they're going to school, they're going to work, they're doing other things, how can we meet all of our goals at, at the same time and in a sequential way? And I'll also give a plug if you're listening to this podcast and you treat autonomic disorders and other from other causes. Maybe you treat long COVID or maybe you have patients who have post-viral infections that cause their aut dysautonomia, still complete your serial exams, right? Not all of their dizziness might be autonomic related. They may also have 3PD or they may also have some type of inner ear dysfunction or so communication pathway issues. They may have visual complaints that would benefit from a, a neurooptometry exam or a specialized PT or OT or SLP who does a vision exam looking at motor function of the eyes. And so don't forget about every other part of the whole person sitting in front of you. And because dysautonomia can feel so overwhelming, it, it'll, it'll become just easy to start to do sequential exams and start to make sure that they get all the pieces addressed that they need. Right. And I think part of becoming more comfortable is trying to sort out kind of what a pattern sounds like and is there any screening that I should be introducing. So one example, because we've done a past journal club on it, is binocular vision dysfunction. There's a questionnaire out there that's Pretty well validated and it could be something to at least try to see oh is this popping up as like something that maybe should would be worth sending my patient to you know taking their time or taking their you know energy if you will to explore that versus another patient where like oh maybe it is but now oh, this is coming up low let's kind of do a little more treatment and see 
and, and, you're, and again, you're always rechecking what's persisting, what's responding to what you're doing, and what isn't changing. Um, and not to kind of, you know, treat them for three years straight in the exact same way without, you know, exploring. It's just not that you're not trying to help, and I respect that. Um, but, you know, it's just kind of that balance. And I think folks particularly who are maybe limited, like they live in a, an area that doesn't have a lot of specialists, you know, it's just much more challenging. And I, I may, <laughs> my sympathies go out strongly um, because even sometimes when you're outside of Philadelphia, I mean, it's just hard to get into the specialists. So maybe they are there, but, you know, it's going to be, you know, six months or something. So, you know, um, we all have our, our challenges, I suppose. But, um, yeah, it, it can feel... Uh, difficult, but just, you know, kind of, again, just kind of look at these circles, say, okay, is this an issue? To what degree I think it's an issue? And, you know, how do we try to kind of prioritize and, and see what's standing out as maybe number one? I know that for me, if the neck is a big issue, I can't do a lot of vestibular, you know, rehab per se, because it's so much should involve head movement and neck movement. So um, I am going to just focus on that neck primarily in the beginning, maybe gentle movements, but that's it, you know, you're really have to think um, kind of what's what's kind of standing up as the, the highest uh, driver is, I think is the term that Lauren used, it's a good way to put it. Um, so this comes from your article and it talks about a few things that I want you all to maybe address for us as well. So this prescription heart rate and the mean delta heart rate, um, I have a couple slides that kind of mention this, but I'd like uh, whoever wants to kind of jump up and explain, you know, what are we looking at here? And, and this is kind of the meat to me uh, of what you guys came up with. So I'm excited. Go ahead, you want to take it? No, oh, sure. Okay. Um, so we were looking at what could be a new measure for us as well. Um, I just can't, how do I see you yeah, I can't for the numbers? There we go. Okay. If you double click on her picture, it'll pull her up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't have those stats memorized. I got to look at the numbers. Fair. <laughs> so we were, we were trying to come up with a variable that we could measure that wouldn't have to do with conditioning or age. Like what is a consistent number? So we threw this idea of a mean delta heart rate difference. And, and somebody's going to have to, like who has a fancy lab, validate that measure, right? Um, but the, the heart rate delta was what was their expected versus what was their achieved. And then we wanted to be able to measure that number as it changed over time. So in the first column, you'll see that it's a 93 beat per minute delta. So what their heart rate threshold should have been was 93 beats per minute different than, the, than what they perceived. That's quite a big difference. Now, we don't know how significant that is for our specific population because no one's ever looked at it before. Maybe that's pretty standard. Maybe we just see like, the worst of the worst. I, I don't. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we maybe hopefully find out in the future. But what we do know is that even though these people w had to have a second test because they weren't back to normal, they hadn't matriculated out. That median or that mean delta difference dropped all the way down to 37 uh, beats per minute just about a month later, one week more than a month later. And so we were able to see physiological changes in their tolerance to exercise even if they had persistent symptoms. And that was really exciting. Now, again, we don't know if that one month having that big of a difference is a big change, if it's not, because we only have 12 people um, for this study, so there's limitations. But it's really exciting, and it's exciting to have a measure that can be more objective, that's not skewed by so many other factors, so that we can go to insurance and we can say, hey, this person, maybe in the future, right, dreamer, uh, that's why Jenna is the realistic person in the group, but like maybe I'd be able to go to regions and say, hey, this person had a 20 beat per minute change score, right, but we still need to get this number. And so we can start to have an objective measurement to argue on behalf of our patient to get them access to the care that they need. Right. And, and as much as we want symptoms and even symptom rating scores to be considered objective measures, um, you know, because they're kind of patient report, um, there's limitations to that, frankly, for, for a variety of reasons, right? So patients, some of them don't want to kind of admit they have symptoms, and then you have patients who feel a lot of everything. And so this is where being able to have, you know, numbers um, that, that are objective, the way we would want to measure range of motion and strength, um, you know, to have this kind of heart response is not 
you know, it's, it's autonomic. It's not something the patient can usually control. Um, so we should be able to utilize that effectively um, for many reasons. And I think, you know, making an argument to continue therapy could be one. Being able to show the patient progress could be another. I think there's a lot of ways that, you know, we consistently uh, as clinicians can find objective measures useful. So that's How about fantastic. the non-compliant patient where you can show them they have no <laughs> physiological change because they, right? Like that's a powerful... <laughs> There's two groups that I feel like this is so, well, three, like the people who need the positive reinforcement that they're getting better, right? The people who are in the middle of a regression and you do a physiological test on them and we don't see the signs of regression that they are perceiving, there's so much power to doing a repeat test for that reason. And then the non-compliant patient, the non-adherent patient, we'll use the more patient-friendly language, adherence versus compliance, right? And so um, this is why it's so important that you do the things that we've asked you to do, because we're looking for your body to show us that you're getting better, um, whether or not your perceived symptoms are improving. We're, we're looking for physiological change, and that can be a powerful conversation to have with a patient as well. For sure. For sure. No, very good point. Um... So, you know, something that was mentioned in the study is this kind of low pre-intervention heart rate threshold um, is something that has been seen in other research. Um, this is, you know, patients who really are not getting their heart rate up very much and then they're feeling, you know, symptoms already. Um, and that could be associated with prolonged concussion, re concussion recovery. Um, so, you know, we care about symptoms, absolutely, and we care about you know, what is the body telling us about kind of what are we dealing with? And, you know, this is to me like one of the best, you know, reasons that we want to continue to educate the public and the community to say like, you know, please don't wait. <laughs> I think that's still an ongoing message that needs to be heard and continues to be nudged um, that could be shouted to the rooftops a million times over in my opinion, like, I'd rather someone come in and be like, well, it might just get better on its own is what I read. Maybe, you know, like, just come in. Like, I'm not going to, like, make you do cartwheels here. Like, I'm just going to get some baseline stuff, you know, make some recommendations. If you do get better, great. Like, I don't need to see you for weeks and weeks. Like, we're good. We're done. You can do everything you want to do functionally, you know, that kind of thing. Or, you know, we kind of maybe do some, if they're an athlete and we want to kind of do some higher level dual test tests or something, fine. But, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's kind of how I feel about it anyway. Like... Let me see you mm -hmm. early, and and then we can be good, as opposed to like, oh, I kind of wish I would have, you know, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I I couldn't agree with you more. I feel like that's one of the biggest challenges is that people just are like, eh, it's not. They wait until it's so bad that they just have no choice but to come in. And if you just get ahead of things, I feel like it's just so much more efficient um, in managing symptoms. Really good. Definitely. All right. Uh, so, although individuals did not experience complete sense of resolution in your study, um, they did show the improvement in that heart rate threshold, um, which supports the use of exercise prescription, um, but they might, you know, take longer, uh, meaning, you know, not necessarily the same as those young athletes, or, you know, there might be other factors that are having them fall on the takes it longer to get better than and what we would have liked to seen or what we hope for or what others have or whatever. <laughs> I would say every brain is unique. So, you know, um, you know, people love to push me for when am I going to, you know, like give what they, they want that prognosis. They want that expectation. I don't make a lot every of promises. <laughs> I don't make they a lot of promises. <laughs> I know. I don't know right? how long it's going to be. And, and season starts. Season hopefully. starts from this date. Or, you know, I'm going to travel <laughs> to Spain with my grandkids or whatever their reason is. I'm like, all right, well, we're going to try. <laughs> Please do everything I tell you to do. That sets you up for your best possible success. <laughs> Under Go. promise and over deliver. <laughs> I mean, right? Right? <laughs> So, um, yes, and this kind of, uh, this continues that theme of just kind of what can people expect and how it really can range as far as, you know, time to recovery. Um, and, you know, again, the folks that are getting better, even at the 90-day mark, a lot of them are getting seen earlier. And, you know, again, the later, the longer. I am not surprised if somebody comes into me five years out. Yeah, you might get better quickly because there's just something that was like a thing that we needed to address that once we addressed it, you're good, but it might take six months plus. I mean, you gotta be realistic. <laughs> but the longer it took for these symptoms to kind of set in, <laughs> you know, that yeah. it could take more time to undo them. So, 
But I think um, the most important thing is the takeaway is that even if you are one of those people that it's going to take longer, it's still possible. And it's that I think is a huge kind of takeaway. From, definitely. From, definitely. All right. So you guys cover the mean Delta. I'm going to slide over this slide. Huh. Um, <laughs> And just know that, you know, there are things that are great takeaways from the study as far as, you know, not being stuck with just kind of one way to look at a buffalo cut concussion treadmill test, you know, and being able to look at exertion and how we should be assessing that. Um, and then I promised uh, a little bit to talk about POTS specifically, and I think Lauren might <laughs> want to start with that. So we've kind of said the word dysautonomia quite a bit. Is that different than POTS? Is it the same? What's going on here? People use them synonymously, but they, but they are not. Um, dysautonomia is the umbrella term, and there's actually 15 current sub-diagnoses. And there was a recent position paper written about orthostatic hypertension, which is actually people who have an increase in their blood pressure um, with a, a correlate of a drop in their heart rate. So the system just works in the reverse of orthostatic hypotension. Um, and so POTS has very specific diagnostic criteria, and it's really important that we stay true to that current literature because in POTS, they tend to have other autoimmune conditions as well, and they can be more medically complex. So we don't want to go labeling people with POTS who don't have it. 85% of patients um, actually have what's called orthostatic intolerance. So that's the biggest bucket. People with POTS have orthostatic intolerance, but um, OI is also the term used for people who don't meet the criteria for a POTS or an orthostatic hypotension diagnosis. Um, so that, that's the biggest thing is you just hear people all the time say they have POTS and then you have to kind of ask more questions like, what, how did you get diagnosed with that? And, and sometimes people have that diagnosis, unfortunately they completed normal orthostatic vitals. So the, the clinician captured that initial heart rate upon standing and that is not what we need for a POTS diagnosis. We actually need a sustained change over time it's totally expected that the heart rate is gonna spike when they first stand up. It's where does it settle as they're standing for a prolonged period of time. Right, so that's a little confusion, right? So orthostatic hypotension, um, many people are more familiar with in the medical world, right? You have this patient, maybe they had a volume loss from a surgery or whatever, they're, you know, have Parkinson's. I mean, there's like a lot of reasons <laughs> why you might um, start to have a drop in blood pressure um, that stays lower than it should when a person goes upright to sitting and certainly to standing is usually when the person feels it the strongest and is more likely to pass out even. Um, it can be why occasionally a patient comes in to see a vestibular PT thinking that they have a vestibular problem, which is, you know, okay, we can figure that out hopefully and point them the right direction. Uh, afterwards, and they probably need exercise, so I have to keep them if I can, um, just to, you know, work on that piece. But, um, you know, this kind of differential, um, and you alluded to that, is this more for, for POTS specifically, is considered to be needing to see that sustained increase in heart rate. Um, and, you know, some people consider the tilt table test to be a gold standard here. Do you think that's necessary to diagnose POTS? The literature is changing, and the recommendations from the national organizations is changing. It used to be that if it wasn't on a tilt table, it didn't count. Um, but that creates a huge access cost and uh, availability problem, right? Especially after COVID now, the average autonomic center has up to a two-year wait for testing, um, which is a lot more chronic deconditioning for the patient. So they are now accepting community-based testing and encouraging. So you can use the active stand test. The NASA lean test is getting a lot of publicity as well right now. Um, there, there is still more validation needed. What, what uh, our protocol between Intermountain and the U is recommending is um, a mixture between the active stand test and the NASA lean test, where they're actively standing for the first five minutes and then leaning for the, for the latter half of the test if necessary. And then the other piece is that orthostatic hypotension, if chronic, not because of a loss of blood volume, um, that is an autonomic disorder as well. And so they really should be being treated on a continuum. It, it used to be that if you have POTS, you're treated like this. And if you have OH, you're treated like this. And if you have OI, you're sent home and told tough noogies, right? And so now it's, let's look at the person in front of us. Let's acknowledge their diagnosis. But, but really the treatment is dependent on their upright and exertional intolerance versus their, their diagnosis itself. OH trumps POTS in all times. So even if they have an elevated heart rate, if they have a sustained drop in their blood pressure, OH is their diagnosis. And it's really important that we understand that as clinicians as well, because these are the people who pass out. 
your people with POTS, if they have a not, uh, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, maybe they're having syncopal episodes. But for the most part, the people who are passing out are going to be your OH people. Um, and they are medically complex and it's dangerous. That's where all your injuries come from. If I have a patient who tells me they passed out and they hit their head and that's how they got their concussion, I have an awful lot of backup questions. I'm going to ask them to back that history up a little bit more. Was this a one-off because it was hot and you were dehydrated? Or do you, are you a serial syncopal, pre-syncopal person? Well, wait, you might have an underlying autonomic disorder. I have to treat your acute concussion, but I can actually do more to help keep you out of the medical system and help keep you from racking up your healthcare dollars um, long term. Right, or breaking a wrist or whatever. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, the debate sometimes comes up, migraine or vestibular migraine, um, which are two different, sometimes overlapping types of migraine. Um, <laughs> and we're not talking about dig into migraine with this talk. It's definitely several other talks. But um, versus POTS or versus dysautonomia, if you will, um, which is a bit more uh, covers many, as you said, um, autonomic issues. I made this. I hope you think it's mostly right. Um, you know, the, the things in the middle are things that I have, you know, read and seen that seem to be more likely to be common. And again, it's not to say that everyone with POTS is going to have headaches or, you know, even people with vestibular migraine headache is sometimes a minor, almost non-mentioned issue. But these are things that might be kind of more uncommon, whereas there's other things like people with just vestibular migraine, that's, that's fun, um, usually are not having a sustained you know, elevation in, in heart rate that's significant over time when upright, right? So um, hopefully this is helpful to folks who have not seen this already that um, I kind of had built um, because I like this kind of visual. It helps me. <laughs> so hopefully it helps other folks. Um, and then I didn't want to leave this talk. We're just about wrapping up here without addressing the, I'm going to still mess it up, Levine. Levine, protocol. Levine. Levine, dang it. See, 50-50 and I get it wrong. All right, Levine protocol is something that I've heard many folks mention as a way to try to address POTS and or dysautonomy in general. I've heard it both ways, um, you know, kind of trying to address this exercise component. Um, generally, to let folks know what it is, it's, you know, starting the patient perhaps whatever position they can handle first, so that might be lying down. And I have Full confession, not because of the Levine protocol, but in general, sometimes I've had to start folks um, exercising lying down because that's all they can really tolerate in the beginning, which could be actually for a couple of reasons, not just as autonomic reasons, but, you know, vestibular issues and, and other situations where you're like, all right, well, I need you exercising. we got to start somewhere. We'll start laying down. You know, you do what you got to do. But um, could you speak to this? And, and it, you know, it's, it's not that it's old, but it, it's been around for a little bit. Um, and your thoughts on it? I was just saying, okay, <laughs> I can just see you every time, like, ready to go. No, I'm waiting. Um, I, was giving, I was giving you the pregnant pause. The pregnant pause. Right. So, I mean, I think the big, Lauren's going to talk about this a lot more because this is her big passion is the POTS component of things. Um, but the Levine Protocol, the, um, you know, it's, it's what there's a lot of research currently available on. So that is kind of the go-to for many people still. Um, there is a lot of stuff being developed and um, some of it from our team, um, but it's not published enough yet to really be standardized out in, um, in practice. Um, so, you know, I think you take it for what it is. It is kind of where, we're st where we started with treatment. Um, and there are still definitely components that are carried forward. Um, as you said, like a lot of patients have to start in that horizontal plane um, and build very gradually from there. So the foundational piece is similar, um, but there are some tweaks that, that I know Lauren's going to want to talk about that she's really pi uh, pioneered, if you will. Girl, All right. So you, got, you got a minute or less here because I don't have a lot of time <laughs> left, Lauren. I know. Sorry. <laughs> So I think that what's, first of all, great about the CHOP Levine protocol is that it can be patient-driven. So if you live in a rural place where there's not access to skilled care, this is wonderful. You can hand it to the patient. It might be overwhelming to receive a 19-page packet on how to treat yourself, but it's something for them to do patient-driven, and I think that's wonderful. As we've been able to develop the research and there's been more clinicians involved and we have more access to care, we can do more. We can do more objective measurements, more objective-based treatments. And so... The, the horizontal to upright is still the foundation of our um, Utah ADAPT protocol. 
And then we built off of the CHOP and the Levine, but we added in objective measures like the Buffalo treadmill test and set heart rate zones versus set um, standardized percentages across your heart rate max to make it tailorable to your patient um, and to help guide your clinical decision making. And then the plug for the horizontal versus the upright exercise, if we boil it down to a much more simple thought process, it's hemodynamics, right? It's the blood flow in your body. If I'm upright against gravity, I'm working harder to maintain blood flow to my brain. If I'm lying down flat, the blood is moving in a single plane. And so if we really just boil it down to how much can the patient move blood flow through their body as they're exerting themselves, it becomes really easy to decide should this patient start on their back, regardless of their diagnosis under the autom- uh, dysautonomia umbrella, can they start seated? Can they start walking? Um, and then that helps guide your clinical decision making versus having to start everybody at the same place um, based on a set protocol. Perfect. She did it. She stayed concise. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> a plus, A plus. And I hope you all don't mind. Uh, I did pull from this article from 2018 um, on some other kind of suggested potential ideas. Um, and I think what I'm hearing again, time and again, and I think um, therapists love it and don't, it's you do have to tailor things. So, you know, what makes sense for one patient on this kind of list here to the right may or may not make sense for another, but, you know, just kind of um, finding ways to, you know, progress the patient with movement, blood flow, and positional tolerance. Um, with, with, you know, assist is needed. Sometimes they're like, oh, if I use a binder, I'm not doing enough for myself. Like, no, no, no. Like, <laughs> it's okay. You know, again, your, your system, I always, I say for this one, I'm like, oh, you got dropped off, you know, in the marathon five miles behind everybody else. Like, you got to, like, you know, have some, maybe a little help in certain areas with different options, including, you know, if it makes sense, compression or something, you know, so just kind of being open to that. Um, and, and a plug for that is that, Exercise for autonomic disorders is a piece of a greater puzzle. You have to do your supportive therapies. You have to do your compression and your volume expansion therapy and your electrolytes like your sodium, um, especially if they're OH or POTS, because you have to increase the blood volume available in order for them to have currency to exercise. So the exercise goal is to improve conditioning, to rewire the nervous system, but you also, it has to be just one piece of a much bigger, um, a much bigger puzzle. And that's really important for clinicians to understand, because if we just exercise, they're probably going to fail. We've got to have those other pieces of supportive therapies involved as well. 100%. All right. So I have this lovely slide up. It's got, you know, two wonderful people on it, of course, that we've been talking to. If you want more of them and you're a physical therapist who plan or physical therapist assistant who plans to go to the combined sections meeting, which is the big physical therapy a kind of yearly conference that's happening in February 2024. They will be speaking on the first day of the event, which is the 15th of February. Um, two different talks, actually. So check out um, the listing of potential uh, talks you can attend and prioritize theirs, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if you want to learn more about dysautonomia, if you're not already aware, the Dysautonomia International website is a lovely resource, highly recommended. And Lauren offered um, for clinicians who want to learn more about the protocol that they're working on um, to use the QR code here on the slide to do that. That is the ADAPT protocol that you mentioned. Um, so we have questions and then we're done because we are probably over time if I had to guess. All right, number one, I think we did this already. Any, this is the emailed questions that I got before this talk. Any recommendations or resources regarding a graded, graded exercise prescription on POTS and dysautonomia? So that's definitely the most common question. Um, so we can certainly use the guidelines on heart rate threshold in the case of, at least I would say, concussion patients who seem to be presenting with some of these issues and then uh, check out that QR code on the previous slide uh, for your next best uh, broader option, I would say. Uh, second question, a patient was advised that his dysautonomia could be treated with neck rehabilitation. What are your thoughts for specific interventions? Yes, and um, probably treating their neck in isolation it isn't going to help with their exertional intolerance, but if they have neck pain and it's limiting their life and it's increasing their sympathetic drive and increasing their heart rate because they're experiencing pain all the time, 
that we also have to treat their neck. We can't just treat them and tell them to exercise and ride a bike every day for 20 minutes and think that that's going to resolve the problem. So I think it, I think it with the biggest takeaway is dysautonomia is a secondary condition caused by other triggering events. So today's topic was about concussion, but you're not necessarily treating long COVID related dysautonomia different than you're treating concussion related dysautonomia. Um, and so it's, it's that you're treating that subset with a set regimen of treatments and you have to treat their vestibular disorder and their, and their primary drivers at the same time. Awesome. All right, Jenna, any final words? We're wrapping up here. I think we covered, I think, you know, the really important parts. Sorry, I am <laughs> still postpartum. So I'm like <laughs> freezing over at this time of night right now. No, you're doing night. awesome. Are you kidding? I could never say oh. that I would even be able to tell. <laughs> Hopefully I'll be better at 8 a.m. at CSM because evenings right now, I'm just like, no. <laughs> um, but I think, no, I think we covered the really important pieces. Um, I think the big takeaway, like that for me, that's most important about the research we're doing is I love that we are expanding to look at these protocols and these treatment um, progressions and things like that. Like I said, in that population outside of the traditionally researched concussion population um, and just giving hope to those that don't fit those typical boxes that they can still modify and adapt these protocols and mm -hmm. tests, et cetera, um, and, and make it work for them. And there, it, it's a, you know, there's hope for them to improve their symptoms in these people who think that they've kind of just like settled into, I'm stuck with this forever. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the big takeaway or one of the big takeaways. Perfect. All right, Lauren, you good? I've used my word allotment for the evening, so I did owe Jenna. If you give her any more time, she's going to talk for the next three hours, so don't. These poor right. listeners are like, are these people done yet? What's We're having on? too much fun, but you know, the, the, the conditions are serious, and our desire and our passion is strong. We want to help these patients. We want to, you know, help the community, and we want to help fellow clinicians to empower each other, to encourage each other you know, to try not to be overwhelmed by these complicated patients. I think that's something that I have struggled with um, and occasionally still, even though I am quite experienced, um, <laughs> you know, and so I just kind of go back to like, you know, what are the resources, look at all the buckets and just take it step by step and, and you're doing a great job. So thank you, Lauren and Jenna, for giving your time tonight. You're both fantastic uh, clinicians and we're very grateful for your research and all that you've done. And everyone else, we look forward to seeing you in our next journal club. Until then, take care.